Section 16 of The Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Vesuvius. 7th February 1645. The next day being Saturday, we went four miles out of town on mules to see that famous volcano, Mount Vesuvius. Here we pass a fair fountain called Labulia, which continually boils, supposed to proceed from Vesuvius, and thence over a river and bridge whereon a large upright stone is engraven a notable inscription relative to the memorable eruption in 1630. Approaching the hill as we were able with our mules, we alighted, crawling up the rest of the proclivity with great difficulty, now with our feet, now with our hands, not without many untoward slips, which did much bruise us on the various coloured cinders with which the whole mountain is covered, some like pitch, others full of perfect brimstone, others metallic, interspersed with innumerable pumices, of all which I made a collection. We at the last gained the summit of an extensive altitude. Turning our faces towards Naples, it presents one of the goodliest prospects in the world. All the bay, Cuma, Elysian fields, Capri, Ischia, Procita, Misenus, Puteoli, that goodly city with a great portion of the Tyrian Sea, offering themselves to your view at once, and at so agreeable a distance as nothing can be more delightful. The mountain consists of a double top, the one pointed very sharp, and commonly appearing above any clouds, the other blunt. Here as we approached we met many large gaping clefts and chasms, out of which issued such sulphurous blasts and smoke that we dared not stand long near them. Having gained the very summit, I laid myself down to look over into that most frightful and terrible virago, a stupendous pit of near three miles in circuit and half a mile in depth by a perpendicular hollow cliff, like that from the highest part of Dover Castle, with now and then a craggy prominency jetting out. The area at the bottom is plain, like an even floor, which seems to be made by the wind circling the ashes by its eddy blasts. In the middle and centre is a hill, shaped like a great brown loaf, appearing to consist of sulphurous matter, continually vomiting a foggy exhalation and ejecting huge stones with an impetuous noise and roaring, like the report of many muskets discharging. This horrid barathrum engaged our attention for some hours, both for the strangeness of the spectacle and the mention which the old histories make of it as one of the most stupendous curiosities in nature, and which made the learned and inquisitive Pliny adventure his life to detect the causes and to lose it in too a desperate an approach. It is likewise famous for the stratagem of the rebel Spartacus, who did so much mischief to the state, lurking among and protected by these horrid caverns, when it was more accessible and less dangerous than it is now. But especially notorious it is for the last conflagration when, in anno 1630, it burst out beyond what it had ever done in the memory of history, throwing out huge stones and fiery pumices in such quantity as not only environed the whole mountain, but totally buried and overwhelmed diverse towns and their inhabitants, scattering the ashes more than a hundred miles, and utterly devastating all those vineyards where formerly grew the most incomparable Greco. When, bursting through the bowels of the earth, it absorbed the very sea, and with its whirling waters drew in diverse galleys and other vessels to their destruction, as is faithfully recorded. We descended with more ease than we climbed up through a deep valley of pure ashes, which at the late eruption was a flowing river of melted and burning brimstone, and so came to our mules at the foot of the mountain. On Sunday, we, with our guide, visited the so much celebrated Bayer and natural rarities of the places adjacent. Here we entered the mountain Porcelippus, 
at the left hand of which they showed us Virgil's sepulchre, erected on a steep rock in form of a small rotunda or cupulated column, but almost overgrown with bushes and wild bay trees. At the entrance is this inscription, Stanisi Kenkovius, 1589, qui cineres, tumuli hic vestigia, conditua olim, ille hoc qui cecenit pasqua rura duces, Cunray, 1553. After we were advanced into this noble and altogether wonderful crypt, consisting of a passage spacious enough for two coaches to go abreast, cut through a rocky mountain near three-quarters of a mile, by the ancient Simmeri, as reported, but as others say by El Cochius, who employed a hundred thousand men on it, we came to the midway, where there is a well bored through the diameter of this vast mountain, which admits the light into a pretty chapel, hewn out of the natural rock, wherein hang diverse lamps perpetually burning. The way is paved underfoot, but it does not hinder the dust, which rises so excessively in this much-frequented passage, that we were forced at midday to use a torch. At length we were delivered from the bowels of the earth into one of the most delicious plains in the world. The oranges, lemons, pomegranates and other fruits blushing yet on the perpetually green trees. For the summer is here eternal, caused by the natural and adventitious heat of the earth, warm through the subterranean fires, as was shown us by our guide, who alighted, and cutting up a turf with his knife, and delivering it to me. It was so hot, I was hardly able to hold it in my hands. This mountain is exceedingly fruitful in vines, and exotics grow readily. Largo Daniano We now came to a lake of about two miles in circumference, environed with hills. The water of it is fresh and sweet on the surface, but salt at bottom, some mineral salt conjectured to be the cause, and it is reported of that profundity in the middle that it is bottomless. The people call it Lago da Nano from the multitude of serpents which involved together about the spring fall down from the cliffy hills into it. It has no fish nor will any live in it. We tried the old experiment on a dog in the Grotto del Carne or Charon's Cave. It is not above three or four paces deep and about the height of a man nor very broad. Whatever having life enters it presently expires. Of this we made trial with two dogs, one of which we bound to a short pole to guide him the more directly into the further part of the den, where he was no sooner entered, but without the least noise or so much as a struggle, except that he panted for breath, lolling out his tongue, his eyes being fixed, we drew him out dead to all appearance, but immediately plunging him into the adjoining lake, within less than half an hour he recovered, and swimming to shore, ran away from us. We tried the same on another dog, without the application of the water, and left him quite dead. The experiment has been made on men, as on that poor creature whom Peter of Toledo caused to go in, likewise on some Turkish slaves. Two soldiers and other foolhardy persons, who all perished and could never be recovered by the water of the lake, as are dogs, for which many learned reasons have been offered, as Simon Majolus in his book of the canicular days has mentioned, Colloc 15. And certainly the most likely is the effect of those hot and dry vapours which ascend out of the earth and are condensed by the ambient cold, as appears by their converting into crystalline drops on the top, while at the bottom it is so excessively hot that a torch being extinguished near it and lifted a little distance was suddenly relighted. Near to this cave are the natural stoves of Saint-Germain, of the nature of solitaries, in certain chambers partitioned with stone for the sick to sweat in, the vapours here being exceedingly hot and of admirable success in the gout and other cold distempers of the nerves. Hence we climbed up a hill, the very highway in several places, even smoking with heat like a furnace. The mountains were by the Greeks called Luke. 
Codier and the fields for Legrian. Hercules here vanquished the giants, assisted with lightning. We now came to the court of Vulcan, consisting of a valley near a quarter of a mile in breadth, the margin environed with steep cliffs, out of whose sides and foot break forth fire and smoke in abundance, making a noise like a tempest of water, and sometimes discharging in loud reports like so many guns. The heat of this place is wonderful, the earth itself being almost unsufferable, and which the subterranean fires have made so hollow by having wasted the matter for, for so many years that it sounds like a drum to those who walk upon it. And the water thus struggling with those fires bubbles and spouts aloft into the air. The mouths of these spiracles are bestrewed with variously coloured cinders which rise with the vapour as do many coloured stones, according to the quality of the combustible matter, insomuch as it is no little adventure to approach them. They are, however, daily frequented, both by sick and well. The former receiving the fumes have been recovered of diseases esteemed incurable. Here we found a great deal of sulphur made, which they refine in certain houses near the place, casting it into canes to a very great value. Near this we were showed a hill of Alum, where it is one of the best mineries, yielding a considerable revenue. Some flowers of brass are found here, but I could not but smile at those who persuade themselves that here are the gates of purgatory, for which it may be they have erected very near it a convent and named it San Januarius, reporting who have often heard screeches and horrible lamentations proceeding from these caverns and volcanoes with other legends of birds that are never seen, save on Sundays, which cast themselves into the lake at night, appearing no more all the week after. We now approach the ruins of a very stately temple or theatre of 172 feet in length and about 80 in breadth, thrown down by an earthquake not long since. It was consecrated to Vulcan, and under the ground are many strange meanders, from which it is named the Labyrinth. This place is so haunted with bats that their perpetual fluttering endangered the putting out our links. Pozzolo Hence we passed again those boiling and smoking hills till we came to Pozzolo, formerly the famous Puteoli, the landing place of St. Paul, when he came into Italy after the tempest described in the Acts of the Apostles. Here we made a good dinner, and bought diverse medals, antiquities, and other curiosities of the country people, who daily find such things among the very old ruins of those places. This town was formerly a Greek colony built by the Samaeans, a seasonable commodious port, and full of observable antiquities. We saw the ruins of Neptune's temple, to whom this place was sacred, and near it the stately palace and gardens of Peter de Toledo, formerly mentioned. Afterward, we visited that admirably built temple of Augustus, seeming to have been hewn out of an entire rock, though indeed consisting of several square stones. The inscription remains thus, El Cafunius L.F. Templum Augusto Comornamentis T.D., and under it, El Coceus El C. Postumi El Auctus Architectus. It is now converted into a church in which they showed us huge bones which they affirmed to have been of some giant. We went to see the ruins of the old haven, so compact with that bituminous sand in which the materials are laid, as the like is hardly to be found though all this has not been sufficient to protect it from the fatal concussions of several earthquakes, frequent here, which have almost demolished it, thirteen vast piles of marble only remaining, a stupendous work in the bosom of Neptune. To this joins the bridge of Caligula, by which, having now embarked ourselves, we sailed to the pleasant Bahia, almost four miles in length, all which way that proud emperor would pass in triumph. Here we rode along toward a villa of the orator Cicero's, 
where he was shown the ruins of his academy, and at the foot of a rock his baths, the waters reciprocating their tides with the neighbouring sea. Hard at hand rises Mount Gorus, being, as I conceived, nothing save a heap of pumices, which here float in abundance on the sea, exhausted of all inflammable matter by the fire, which renders them light and porous, so as the bears of nitre, which lie deep under them, having taken fire, do easily eject them. They dig much for fancied treasure, said to be concealed about this place. From hence we coasted near the ruins of Portus Iulius, where we might see diverse stately palaces that had been swallowed up by the sea after earthquakes. Coming to shore, we passed by the Lucrine Lake, so famous heretofore for its delicious oysters, now producing few or none, being divided from the sea by a bank of incredible labour, the supposed work of Hercules. It is now half choked up with rubbish, and by part of the new mountain, which rose partly out of it and partly out of the sea, and that in the space of one night and a day, to a very great altitude, on the 29th September 1538, after many terrible earthquakes, which ruined diverse places thereabout, when at midnight the sea, retiring near two hundred paces, and yawning on the sudden, it continued to vomit forth flames and fiery stones in such quantity as produced this whole mountain by their fall, making the inhabitants of Pozzolo to leave their habitations, supposing the end of the world had come. From the left part of this we walked to the Lake Avernus, of a round form, and totally environed with mountains. This lake was feigned by the poet for the gates of hell, by which Aeneas made his descent, and where he sacrificed to Pluto and the Manes. The waters of a remarkably black colour, but I tasted of them without danger. Hence they feign that the river Styx has its source. At one side stand the handsome ruins of a temple dedicated to Apollo, or rather Pluto, but it is controverted. Opposite to this, having new lighted our torches, we enter a vast cave, in which, having gone about two hundred paces, we pass a narrow entry which leads us into a room of about ten paces long, proportionally broad and high. The side walls and roof retain still the golden mosaic, though now exceedingly decayed by time. Here is a short cell, a rather niche, cut out of the solid rock, somewhat resembling a couch, in which they report that the Sibylla lay and uttered her oracles, but is supposed by most to have been a bath only. This subterranean grot leads quite through to Cuma, but is in some places obstructed by the earth which has sunk in, so as we were constrained back again and to creep on our bellies before we came to the light. It is reported Nero had once resolved to cut a channel for two great galleys that it should have extended to Ostia, 150 miles distant. The people now call it Licola. From hence we ascended to that most ancient city of Italy, the renowned Cuma, built by the Grecians. It stands on a very eminent promontory, but is now a heap of ruins. A little below stands the Arco Felice, heretofore part of Apollo's temple, with the foundations of diverse goodly buildings, among whose heaps are frequently found statues and other antiquities by such as dig for them. Near this is the Lake Atirutia and Acheron. Returning to the shore, we came to the Bagni di Tritoli and Diana, which only long narrow passages cut through the main rock where the vapours ascend so hot that entering with the body erect you will even faint with excessive perspiration. But stooping lower, a sudden a cold surprises. These sudateries are much in request for many infirmities. Now we enter the haven of the Bahiae, where once stood that famous town, so called from the companion of Ulysses, here buried not without great reason, celebrated for one of the most delicious places that the sun shines on, according to that of Horace, nullus in orbe locus, baius prelucet, 
Eminis. Though, as to the stately fabrics, there now remain little save the ruins, whereof the most entire is that of Diana's temple, another of Venus. Here were those famous poles of lampreys that would come to hand when called by name, as Marshall tells us. On the summit of the rock stands a strong castle, garrisoned to protect the shore from Turkish pirates. It was once the retiring place of Julius Caesar. Passing by the shore again, we entered Bauli, observable from the monstrous murder of Nero committed on his mother Agrippina. Her sepulchre was yet shown us in the rock which we entered, being covered with sundry heads and figures of beasts. We saw there the roots of a tree turned into stone and are continually dropping. Messenus, thus having viewed the foundations of the old Samaria, the palaces of Marius, Pompey, Nero, Hortensius and other villas and antiquities, we proceeded toward the promontory of Messenus, renowned for the sepulchre of Aeneas's trumpeter. It was once a great city, now hardly a ruin, said to have been built from this place to the promontory of Minerva, fifty miles distant, now discontinued and demolished by the frequent earthquakes. Here was the villa of Caius Marius, where Tiberius Tiberius Caesar died, and here runs the aqueduct thought to be dug by Nero, a stupendous passage, heretofore nobly arched with marble, as the ruins testify. Hence we walked to those receptacles of water called Piscina Mirabilis, being a vault of five hundred feet long and twenty-two in breadth, the roof propped up with four ranks of square pillars, twelve in a row. The walls of brick, plastered over with such a composition as for strength and polyture resembles white marble. It is conceived to have been built by Nero as a conservatory for fresh water, as were also the Centi Camarelli, into which we were next led. All these crypta being now almost sunk into the earth, show yet their former amplitude and magnificence. Returning toward the Bayer, we again pass the Elysian fields, so celebrated by the poets, nor unworthily, for their situation and verdure being full of myrtles and sweet shrubs, and having a most delightful prospect towards the Tyrian Sea. Upon the verge of these remain the ruins of the Mercato di Sabato, formerly a circus, over the arches stand divers urns, full of Roman ashes. Having well satisfied our curiosity amongst these antiquities, we retired to our felucca, which rowed us back again towards Pozzolo, at the very place of St. Paul's Landing. Keeping along the shore, they showed us a place where the sea water and sands did exceedingly boil. Thence to the island Nessus, once the fabulous nymph, and thus we leave the buyer so renowned for the sweet retirements of the most opulent and voluptuous Romans. They certainly were places of uncommon amenity, as their yet tempting sight and other circumstances of natural curiosities easily invite me to believe, since there is not in the world so many stupendous rarities to be met with as in the circle of a few miles which environ these blissful abodes. Naples 8th February 1645 Returned to Naples, we went to see the arsenal, well furnished with galleys and other vessels. The city is crowded with inhabitants, gentlemen and merchants. The government is held of the Pope by an annual tribute of 40,000 ducats and a white genet, but the Spaniard trusts more to the power of those his natural subjects there. Apulia and Calabria yielding him near four millions of crowns yearly to maintain it. The country is divided into 13 provinces, 20 archbishops and 107 bishops. The estates of the nobility, in default of the male line, reverting to the king. 
Besides the Viceroy, there is among the chief magistrates a High Constable, Admiral, Chief Justice, Great Chamberlain and Chancellor, with a Secretary. These being prodigiously avaricious, do wonderfully enrich themselves out of the miserable people's labour, silks, manna, sugar, oil, wine, rice, sulphur and alum, for with all these riches is this delicious country blessed. The manna falls at certain seasons on the adjoining hills in form of a thick dew. The very winter here is a summer, ever fruitful, so that in the middle of February we had melons, cherries, apricots and many other sorts of fruits. The building of the city is for the size the most magnificent of any in Europe. The streets exceeding large, well paved, having many vaults and conveyances under them for the sewage, which renders them very sweet and clean, even in the midst of winter. To it belongeth more than three thousand churches and monasteries, and these the best built and adorned of any in Italy. They greatly affect the Spanish gravity in their habit, delight in good horses, the streets are full of gallants on horseback, in coaches and sedans, from hence brought first into England by Sir Sanders Duncombe. The women are generally well featured, but excessively libidinous, the country people so jovial and addicted to music that the very husbandmen almost universally play on the guitar singing and composing songs in praise of their sweethearts and will commonly go to the field with their fiddle they are merry witty and genial all which i much attribute to the excellent quality of the air they have a deadly hatred to the french so that some of our company were flouted at for wearing red cloaks as the mode then was this I made the non ultra of my travels, sufficiently sated with rolling up and down, and resolving within myself to be no longer an individuum vagum if ever I got home again, since from the report of diverse experienced and curious persons I had been assured there was little more to be seen in the rest of the civil world, after Italy, France, Flanders and the Low Country, but plain and prodigious barbarism. End of section 16